Shell or Steam Boy or Corporal Rose. Yeah! Or Paprika. Yes. I'm also a big fan of some films you may not know, but you should know, like Chico and Rita. Yeah. Right. How about The Rabbi's Cat? Yeah. Right. Oscar nominated. <laughs> My reason for pushing to include the animated Cowboy Bebop in this year's films is that while I think it's exciting and wonderful as much anime, it's so very different and indeed unique if you really look at it, that I think it's in really in a category of its own. Uh, in LA Times, Flick Picks on Thursday, thanks Sherry, Bebop was called a Japanese anime sci-fi fantasy. That kind of shorthand, I guess, helpful in an audience. But besides deputing, disputing anime, I don't totally buy that it's science fiction or fantasy, <laughs> except in the, in the wide sense that it takes place in the future. To me, the show doesn't even seem really that Japanese. In my opinion, the picture func functions pretty much like a classic live-action film noir, yeah. with rocket planes and futuristic machinery, and it takes place on Mars. So it seems as if the filmmakers are working in the fantasy genre, but this picture plays it so tough and cool and next door to realistic, what actual, what, what actual fantasy moments are there in the movie? Emotion is such a huge concern throughout this movie. Where really are the fantasy elements? The city, for instance. It may seem like the kind of place you see in other anime, but there's a believability and a great reality in what you, in, in, the, in it, that you don't see. Even in, we all see these live action, gigantic live action films set in the future, or on other planets, and produced on stage at great expense, with real actors, but they're not real, not like, not like this cartoon. If you create a world, even a drawn world, where humans believably live, the humanity is built into the story. And I think that's what we've done. That's something that design brings to a film. It's easy for me to forget I'm watching animation. Bebop to me is simply a movie. Maybe I'm wrong. We'll discuss that later. Maybe, maybe guests will tell me I'm off base. I want to point out a couple of things um, that are so good that you could easily miss them, not spoilers. First of all, this is not a mocap film. This is a classically animated, old school kind of movie. There's some rotoscoping, uh, as most of you probably know, and some use of certainly reference, you know, uh, Bruce Lee and the fighting. There's a tiny amount of CG, but basically it's an incredibly charming, hand-drawn, animated picture. Amazing. You also might want to, for those of you who don't know, again, you might want to pay special attention to the music, which, like everything else, is so much more interesting and sophisticated than one would expect. A lot of it reminds me of Lalo Schifrin, if you know Lalo, writing it like the best 1970s cop show theme ever. I mean, that's really this movie. Plus, there are folk songs and torch songs, all sorts of smoky jazz bluesy numbers, and all by Yoko Kano. A Japanese composer. And yes, she happens to be a lady. <laughs> Here's how tonight's program's gonna run. By now I've either intrigued you or over-intellectualized everything. <laughs> either way, perfect setup for a sort of sizzle reel that we've prepared to introduce you to the Bebop universe. Maybe, it, maybe there's one or two people out here who don't know this, but Bebop is also a 26 episode TV show. Yeah. <laughs> Great, uh, great saw the banner great outside, music. like, that sounds neat. None of which, <laughs> so the rest of it's reused in the feature. The feature's all new. So we added that into a short clip reel just to get your blood going. After that reel, I'm going to introduce you to our two guests on a couple minutes each of their work, just so you have a sense of what high-quality talent we've lined up for the after-screening discussion, which we fully expect you to participate in. So let's run the uh, World of Bebop reel. what happens at the end of your career, right? <laughs> Hopefully that's not a sign of things to come. <laughs> I was trying to entertain him in your absence by uh, having a contest with no prize for the, uh, for the uh, radical Edward zone. I do. Sorry, technical difficulties here. I, well, actually, I don't. I'll just stick it on somewhere. I'll just hold it. <laughs> 
Uh, I didn't get to, actually. Well, I, thought, I thought you described her to me. No, I described her because I had seen video of her with her band, The Seatbelts. Uh -huh. And uh, Yoko was like, this tall. <laughs> and she plays with this insane band, the band that you heard here, The Seatbelts. Uh -huh. And it's, it's a uh, master musicians from all over Japan. How big, how big a band? I think there were close to 20 pieces, maybe a little more. Yeah. Oh, really? And uh, she looks like... Um, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, she's, I mean, literally, she's, she's this crazy mad woman uh, who, she's a, a brilliant pianist and uh, probably multi-instrumentalist, multi I would imagine. But she just, she stands in the midst of all these guys and just relishes it and just, the arms are going crazy and she's dancing around and she really has the moves like Edward. She's, you know, the arms are moving up and down and stuff. She's, she's awesome. But that, that brain, that music is, is uh, one of the most spectacular things I've heard in in, in any film series, any you know, uh, I looked at the film this time, and to me, it's just poetry. I mean, yeah. sorry guys, it's supposed to be anime, but it's really so poetic. I mean, all of it with the butterflies, things I've sort of forgotten. Yeah. I mean, you have to tell us what it was like, how you got sucked into this, and and because I know you did it in pieces, and yeah. and who was directing you, and if uh, Watanabe was around. Just, I'm sure everyone. Very interested in that. Well, like most anime, we're kind of working in a vacuum, in a small padded room, basically by ourselves with the director on the other side of the glass. The director is Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. <laughs> Just Mary's amazing. And uh, in this case, for, the, for most of the series, we were working in a small studio in um, North Hollywood, I believe. And uh, for this film, we were actually working at Sony Studios and in one of their big ADR rooms. And it was kind of a crazy thing, because usually Mary and I would work together uh, just by ourselves or with some of the other people from the company. And in this case, there were some executives from Sony overseeing the project. And there was this guy, I don't remember his name now, but he came out of his office, and he wanted to have some input on the film, and particularly on the writing of the film. He wasn't a writer, he was an executive, and putting up some of the money for it, apparently. And I just remember being up at the microphone and we're working on some difficult scenes and this guy's literally pacing back and forth behind me. You can hear his footsteps, it's all being recorded. And he just has no sense of, uh, you know, um, the necessity for quiet in the room or concentration really wasn't an issue for him. So uh, that was kind of jarring in itself. But as far as getting involved in the series in the, in the first place, I auditioned for it blindly like I did for everything else. So, how did you develop this, this voice? I mean, did they say a young Clint Eastwood that's hipper than Clint Eastwood, or what? Uh, what, what kind of direction did you get? How did you, how did you find this voice? Well, fortunately, it's my voice. It's my speaking voice. But as, as, far, as, <laughs> as far as the badassery of Spike that I had to kind of channel into, and, and I really didn't think that I was up for the challenge. I, I thought that they had the wrong guy at first. Once I saw the complexity of my scenes, I didn't see the whole thing in its entirety. They kind of kept me in the dark as I was going through the process. Um, but I, I really didn't think that I was the right guy for the job, and I just sort of did it organically, like I did everything else. I'm not a trained actor. So I just went by what I saw on the screen and, and just sort of dug in. And did you get much direction from, from Mary? I did, yeah. Fortunately, Mary was there. She's my lifeline and she has been on many, many shows. We've worked on a lot of shows together and Mary really knew the context of the, the project and uh, especially in the scenes with Electra in the cells. Um, that, that was probably the most emotional, realistic thing I had ever done. Most of my characters were, you know, crazy creatures and things. And but you'd already done 26 episodes of a television show. Yes, but the TV show was... Uh, very action oriented, and we had you know funny scenes between Spike and Jet, and, and uh, lots of different types of emotions. But that was probably the deepest I had to dig, and for me that was the most uncomfortable, uh, sitting in in that space and in my head, and actually having to go to a very vulnerable place for Spike was really tough for me. I had never done that as an actor before. To me, that was what real acting is, and everything else was just play at time. I thought I was getting away with it until then. <laughs> he busted me. So. It's so interesting because I, I don't know you that well, but. He's so sardonic, and there's so much going on there that you don't know about, I guess. Yeah. It's within you. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I have a dark side. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should ask Peter about He directed a lot of big, big, big actors in uh, Guardians. What was that like? Um, as, as an artist, really. 
Yeah, you know, I don't think it's any different from directing actors for live action or stage or anything. And, you know, from what you're saying about the process with Mary, it's just you give the, act, the actor the context of a given scene, you know. Um, you just you just kind of flesh out as much as you can of, uh, of the moment, of the world, whatever, for the actor in the booth. That's really all you need, you know. If you have a, I think if you have a good, uh, a good director who understands the script and understands, you know, the emotional beats that have to be hit, can take an actor through something without that actor really knowing the, the much larger context. So I can I can totally see how you did it. It was a great performance. By oh, thank you. Really great. Really. Great. Well, All the elements were there for Bebop in the series and in the film, and, and I felt like I got to put a little cherry on top at the end. You know, I was, I was so lucky. Uh, it's, I think it's rare to see a film, especially um, an animated film at that time, to um, bring all those elements together so beautifully. Now, I mean, I, I, you know, you can say that oh, it's so much live action. It's it's so much light live action. You know, it's so it, it's got the nuance and the texture and the. It's just a good film. Period. I mean, it's a beautifully directed. Film. If this was a live, if this exact same film was live action, it would be a cut above just about anything that's out in the theaters now. I think it's it's just beautiful. It's poetic, as John said. And me, to me, in, in a sense, of film noir. I mean, it's like a Chandler or, or, or a Kane or one of those guys. I mean, I wish cop shows on TV. I would watch more cop shows on TV <laughs> if they had this this quality. Yeah, but it's got all these cool, just quirky touches too. Like, and a lot of the the editing when they cut out of a scene, how they get out of something and go to the next scene, it's really fresh and it's really, you know, the music choices are uh, to most uh, to most American produced animation. It's like, no, really, I'm honest. I'm, see, I'm here to tell you, it's it's uh, these guys aren't wearing Hawaiian. Shoes. <laughs> well, listen, since you talked about Sony being involved, that's interesting to me. Because here's a trivia question. Does anybody know how much... This, this picture was only released once theatrically in the United States. How much money did it make in the, in the States? Gross. A million dollars. A million dollars. How is that possible? Because in the rest of the world, it only made another two million. And this is astonishing. I made forty-five dollars. <laughs> biggest part of the budget. So you had a, it sounds like you had a piece of the action there. So, um, <laughs> well, you had to drive to Irvine to see it. You had to drive to Irvine. Yes. Yeah. I saw it in a little theater in Pasadena, almost by myself, of course. Me and three buddies. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Bought me a bag of French fries. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the animation for a second, because Peter obviously knows that inside and out. So this is indeed a keyframe traditional animated picture, right? With a few exceptions. Oh, sorry, folks. We're changing my show. Yay! Yeah, my guy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um. Uh, that's you know. Uh, it's traditional animation. It's the same way anime has been done since, you know, Kimba the White Lion and all that other stuff. You know? And uh, which is part of the great, another part of what's great about it is that it's not that different from other anime that's been, you know, it's like it's groundbreaking as far as anime. It's just a really fantastic uh, and sort of. Uh, it's just just a just a really modern, fresh, contemporary take on it. I think that that preserves everything that was great about it, the emotionalism, the the, uh, the subtlety, the kind of, all the nods to you know the a real world filmmaking that that just make it that much uh, that much more relatable. I mean, there's stuff like the stuff you see a lot in, in anime, good anime, the street scene stuff that just like builds the world for you and creates just these little quiet moments that. Lets you kind of get into the rhythm of that world and makes it that much more real, and that's the the beautiful stuff that uh, you know other animation traditions kind of ignore a lot of the time. It's pure anime. It's gorgeous. Now you did it. Your picture, of course, is well. Tell tell us what sort of animation you used. Whether you used motion capture or uh, we used motion capture, but only for uh, layout and rough blocking. 
hundred percent of the animation we did is keyframe animation. So Why it's just as it's keyframe. Uh, keyframe <laughs> animation is just an animator animating a character's movements frame by frame. So there's no push a button and a machine, you know, does it or fills in anything for you. It, it's basically hand-drawn animation, only you're drawing it on a computer. Basically, it's so dimensional. It has so much volume to the figures. It, it, I, I, I assume they were probably manipulating something on a, on a dimensional screen or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, you do. When, when you're doing when you're doing a CG animation, the figures, you know, you have or you're working with re real models and they rotate in space. So you, all of that is part of the process. But every single eye blink and move is controlled by a person. So it's it's not. We're not just you know setting somebody up with eight cameras and filming them and turning that into CG. And that's what you see. It's, it's a created performance by the animators. And you had a tremendous amount of emotion in your picture as well. Was there a particular way to approach that? Uh, just trying to make it real, the same, the same way they do in anime, which, which was, a, uh, that way it was definitely a stylistic influence for us, uh, the way that um, in anime you get this kind of shift between real subtle and uh, delicate and all, almost... Uh, uh, you know, a lot of times the studio would push on us because ah, they're they're not smiling big enough when they smile, or they're not frowning enough when they're sad. And, eh. But that's you know a little closer to you know what we call good acting. You know, <laughs> it's just not. You know, and it's it's uh, again it's slightly out of phase with most uh, American anime. And it, well, the, but the other thing about anime is sometimes there's like over the top cartoon. You know, so I'm cutting in and out. But these two these two things kind of. Uh, uh, sit side by side, and in a, a, a film like this, it really works well. You know, you've got a character like uh, like Edward, you know, who sometimes is straight out of a cartoon, and you've got scenes like in the the cell with uh, uh, Spike, and uh, and and it's just you know, it's it's the real thing. So, am I turning something off by mistake? I don't know. It's my pace. My test test. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Oh, that's my real voice, too. Thanks. <laughs> I think I was done. Okay. Uh, well, I think we talked about this. Not, not, not here yet. But, uh, Steve, um, Mr. McGillicuddy. Uh, yeah, done. You're done. <laughs> How about the look and feel? Because cartoons, and even within anime, are all over the place. Does that... How does that work with your performances, or, or does Mary maybe Mary look at the film as a whole? Is it something you can speak to, or am I really kind of... Yeah, it's, it's really hard to speak to that uh, for me as an animation actor, because most of the time I don't get to see it prior really? to my performance, yeah. Um, in this case, I would see the scene maybe once, uh, just before I went into it, and then it's just one, two, three, go, and I, I didn't read the script in advance. There's, there's really no preparation for that. So it, it's really gut most of it's either gut or Mary setting the context for me, or, you know, whoever my director is at the time, and just kind of have to go by what's on the screen. And um, for me, that works. I started in anime. I didn't have a classic acting background. So uh, I, I came in just matching lip flaps and matching characters to the best of my ability, and it's, it's all instinct. So. Just out of, how many takes do you usually get to do to get the lip sync right? Because that's hard. We did probably more takes on this than we did in the series, but generally, if you can't do it in three takes, they'll look for another actor because you know, <laughs> they're on time schedule. And yeah. and for uh, anime in uh, TV shows, particularly, they want you to do about forty lines an hour, something like that. And, and um, you don't get the you, you don't see the script beforehand. You don't see the script beforehand. That's Sometimes nice. you don't even get a preview of the scene beforehand. That's and basically, you're three beeps and you're going, and you just have to match up as best you can and look at the page and look at the screen at the same time. And it's just a, it's a juggling act. It's a wow. skill set that you have to have to do this work. But I, I, again, I think you may be being too modest about your instincts, because if, if indeed you saw the scene with Electra and Spike, if you just saw that cell even in a bad black and white dupe, it would give you a sense emotionally of where they are. And obviously, you did it properly. Thank I mean, you. That's what we look for as designers. I mean, yeah. you know, most of the time, we'll design a set or we'll design a big, whatever we design. We don't. Talk, we often don't talk to the actors about what it is. They walk in the set, and ideally, they get something. We're moved by it. Yeah. 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 Ideally, but not always. But yeah, I didn't really have that luxury. But you did. Say, you said you saw the scenes at least. I would think. In in most cases, you try to play it at least once. Yeah. You know, at, at least the line. Yeah. But, but 
that I was going to be doing. It wasn't necessarily even in the full context of the scene. It might just be a line ahead or a few lines ahead, just so I have a little bit of context there. Well, I can also tell you as a, as a designer, I'll have a secret out of the bank, which is a lot of time you read the script and you see a set in your mind and it never changes. Uh, the very first. Do you agree, Peter? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, a, a lot of things are like that. You latch onto something right away that comes out of the, you know, comes out of the script and, and in some way, shape, or form, that's what it ends up being. It shows what a big free ride pre production is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. I should mention, by the way, that if you guys want to have a question, you're certainly welcome. Already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that tell me that 
you know, watching this kind of stuff has saved their lives because it kept them sane on the battlefield. Those are the kinds of stories that really gave me the full impact of what I was doing. And so it, I, it's a really hard question to answer as far as, you know, me breathing life into it. That All I'm doing is, you know, just putting a voice to what I'm seeing on the, the screen or, you know, what's coming out of my head. I'm just doing an organic thing. The real life is your perception of it. Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Speak. Two modest. 
<laughs> great. So what's your favorite anime? Uh, Bebop. <laughs> I, I actually haven't watched that much anime. I, like I said, I only watched Bebop two years ago. Uh, probably the only other anime that I watched end-to-end -end was Digimon because I was a writer for it. Yeah.
this may answer the question. I had this strange um, realization that I basically am living the way I wanted to live when I was about 13 or 14. <laughs> the stuff I do, and the house I live in, and the wife I have. It's pretty much what I wanted as like an early teenager. Whatever, whatever that is. Wow. I dreamed of the wife you have, too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's all just a fantasy. Uh, no, I, I, that's a really big question. Uh, I, I think that's, that goes really deep. Um, I think that this is all an illusion, honestly. It just is, and it's, it's whatever we create it to be. We are all that powerful. I actually mean that from a sincere place. These guys are modest and deep, both. How about the guy right who are your favorite voice actors? You want to you take that one first? Me? Oh, God. Uh, say Steve Dunn. Say Steve Dunn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm <We're> not <laughs> Steve's obviously awesome. Uh, I, ha I haven't dealt with that many. I mean, you know, the cast of Guardians was like gigantic actors. So, so everybody's. They're all incredible. <laughs> We're really expensive, so... Done? It's done, right? So, <laughs> uh, I have so many favorites, man. Um, I'm, I'm so lucky to work in the voiceover community of non-celebrities, no offense. <laughs> but there are so many brilliant, brilliant people in the voiceover community that I'm in awe at every session I attend. Um, you mentioned Crispin Freeman before. Crispin just has a flavor all his own. He's, he's really amazing. There's, there's so many that, that I'm... I'm just in awe of on a daily basis. Uh, since I started as a creature guy, I'm uh, specifically interested in guys who can do really great creature work. Uh, number one being Frank Welker, mm -hmm. who has done basically every creature sound in every Disney film you've ever heard of. Um, and he's oh. Scooby-Doo and Freddy and uh, Transformers. He's my Megatron. Um, uh, Dee Bradley Baker, who's Yay. also a fantastic not only great creature guys, but they're, they're great impressionists, they're great actors, they can do everything. Uh, Fred Tattashore, yeah. Fred Tattashore yeah. saw and an animator, yes, Fred is an animator as well, you're right. Uh, but God, the laundry list is, is miles long, there are hundreds that I could mention, it would take up the whole rest of the evening, but um, everybody has something to bring to the table, Again, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. chess with any of the characters that I've voiced, who would it be in mind? <laughs> Somebody who's never played chess before. Like, <laughs> I'd have my son Jeremy play for me because he's really good. That's, that's Jeremy. That's Jeremy right there, yeah. My, and one of my other sons here, Brandon. Brandon's here too. There's Brandon. That's, that's my other boy right there. <laughs> Sons of Spike. Son of Spike, yes. Spike has procreated. <laughs> It was a good dream. <laughs> My favorite voice acting role? Uh, I can't choose. You know, I choose one, they start fighting, and my head will explode. <laughs> uh, they're, they're really, honestly, like part of me or, or children to me. You know, I, I, each one represents a different piece of my psyche, even the smallest bit characters. I love playing little bit characters, and even if I don't remember them, in that moment, they're really, really fun for me. Part of it is the non-commitment. You know, I can just kind of go on and do something else. But I really enjoy playing different characters every day, and in some days I'll play 15, 20 different characters. And it's, it's, uh, it relieves a lot of tension uh, from road rage and you know, whatever else happens in life. It's actually very, very therapeutic to do that. So I, I cherish each one for the contribution they've made in my life. Oh, thanks. Oh, thank you. Oh, very cool, yeah. He's got my face on. Well, the face that was in front of my face. <laughs> you should tell us uh, how you got your first job. Oh, man. My first job. This, this will be inspiring <coughs> to people. Uh, do you know the story? Well, you told me. I, well, I don't think I told you the first story. Oh. 
Well, actually, I told you part of it. Yeah, I told you part of it. I was working in a mail room for a low-budget film company, uh, and we were making these crazy movies. We made Reanimator. If you guys are familiar with that, it was a film company called Empire Pictures, which later on became Full Moon Entertainment. I stayed with that company for about 15 years. But very early on, when I was working in the mail room, there was a guy named Victor Garcia, the head of the mail room, and he was casting this Japanimation thing on the weekend. And, <laughs> right, my, that was my response exactly. What's Japanimation? And I see. Um, <laughs> so I, I said, well, I'm not an actor. Everybody else in the mailroom was an actor. Everybody else in Hollywood was an actor. <laughs> and uh, so they all said yes immediately. And I went, I don't know. And he goes, just come in. I just, you have the deepest voice in the mailroom. We need a deep voice in here. We got some monster things. All you have to do is growl, and I'll pay you seven dollars a line if you can book the job and we'll feed you breakfast and lunch and so i said okay that, that was enough for me i was hungry so i went on a saturday morning to this crazy treehouse studio it was literally it was a place called the cave that this rock and roller had built in his backyard and dug out part of this cave and there's a tree up against it and he literally built this little treehouse thing and we went up into this thing. We had to drag all the equipment up into the into the cave because he didn't have anything to sync up time code. He was used to recording rock and roll. And so literally all of us, that was part of our duty and part of the audition was to go in there and drag up all this stuff up the hill and get into the treehouse. About four hours later, after we'd eaten all the food that they had and they had to go out and get more, they finally were ready to record. And there were about 20 of us there recording all of us at once. And I went in and they gave me the part of this character called a zoonoid. And they just had this scene where they wanted me to do the sound of this creature ripping the arm off of another creature. And so I just went in and went, <laughs> and they said, okay, that's good. <laughs> now can you do that with the words? And so I did a few words and, and it worked out. And so they hired me for the day and, and they kept hiring me. And there were 26 episodes of the series and it was called The Giver. <laughs> yeah. The Giver was my very first show. And I ended up playing the main bad guy. Uh, I was Giver 3 Agito on this thing. And, and so I had to learn how to do English words and match the lip flaps. And we didn't even have beeps at that time to guide us into where the lip flaps started. All we had was a time code that was running. And we had to try to visually catch it to know when we started. And it, I was so crappy at it, I wasn't an actor. They actually had to have a guy standing behind me to tap me on the shoulder when it was my <laughs> turn to go. But I locked into it. And because I was a musician before that, the language is very rhythmic, and I was able to lock right in, and it was actually a very easy, organic process for me. So what was your first job, Peter? Oh, uh, my first ever job. Um, my first movie storyboarding job was on a movie that never got made. Uh, it was uh, an independent movie about uh, Michelangelo carving the statue of David. And I'd gotten it through this agency that I had been with. There was a uh, an agency, the Rep Storyboard Artists. At the time, they did all commercials, but they were moving into movies. Uh, they got me this movie. Uh, this guy, uh, Frank Lelogia, uh, quite quite a good director who had done a movie called Lady in White, that was really good, was trying to get this movie going. And I was pretty green, it was my first one, but, you know, kind of jumped on in. And he said, oh, and by the way, we're going to go location scouting in Florence for five weeks, so I hope you're cool with that. So like, oh, great, good. So it was like, that was my baptism into movies, and like I said, the movie never got made, but uh, by the time it was all over, I had this kind of big, fat book of samples, and based on that, I got more work, and I was on a job that I got lucky and got into the union, and then I got in, you know, got to work on union films, and it was like, off to the races after that. Wow, if you started by <laughs> illustrating Michelangelo, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's pretty know, good chops right there. <laughs> no, you got to try to improve things where you can. <laughs> you work with what you have. <laughs> I want to come up and see your etchings, mister. <laughs> um, I had a question uh, for you, Peter. Um, I've been uh, going to a lot of anime conventions, partly for work, partly for fun, and I can't tell you how many Jack Frost cosplayers I've seen. Like, every single one of them is a pretty good flesh post, and you've got wherever you go. And a lot of people have hoodies. Also, <laughs> Was it better? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
I, I think there's plenty. I mean, what, all we did really was, you know, a lot of us really were big fans of, of anime and wanted to bring some of that design sensibility into uh, our characters and the way we were telling the story because it, it was a it was a weird hybrid kind of movie that we were trying to make. So anime seemed like kind of the right fit for sort of a fantasy superhero magic adventure. And I. I I just think there's a lot of things, I think there's a lot that's kind of crept into um, American movies anyway. I think Pixar, in Pixar there's a lot of uh, influence from Miyazaki and, and, you know, some of the calmness of some of their better storytelling I think comes from anime and the Japanese tradition, stuff like that. So I think it's one of those undercurrents that's going to always sort of be there because the studios really, I mean, everybody wants to stick despicable to me now, basically, which is, you know, it's another, you know, it's a, it's fun and it's a, it's a different tradition, but it's counter to that kind of, uh, the kind of anime storytelling that really has the, kind of the soul of anime, I guess. And uh, also, yeah, it is, it is weird. I mean, a lot of people are really resistant to it in America, though. I mean, a lot of people, there's a, there's, you're either, Disney style or your anime style, and it's like a civil, weird civil war or something. So <laughs> it's strange, but I, I think the cross pollination is just going to happen naturally and organically, and it already is. Yeah, did I enjoy playing Starscream in Prime? <laughs> yes, it was like a boy's dream come true. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, working on anything Transformers, being part of that franchise was amazing. And, and I came in at the right time in history when Frank Welker and Peter Cullen were back together again, uh, which they had been for many, many years. Uh, so just to work in the same room with them and breathe that air was amazing. And there were a lot of guys who had worked on G1 uh, who were part of the series, too. And uh, incredible cast, incredible writing. It, I, I was pinching myself every day in that series. That's the best phone cover I've ever seen, by the way. She has a Wolverine phone cover, by the way. That's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, it was amazing. I'm interested in doing writing for anime. Do you offer any internships? Yeah, DreamWorks does. Yeah, yeah, they definitely do. Um, you should. Uh, there is a whole recruiting department. There, you know, always looking for people. Yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, if if you, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way. Uh, there might even be just a way to, to email them directly, like the, the DreamWorks recruiting or something like that. I'm, I'm sure there is. It's, but it's, uh, or you could call the studio. It's eight one eight six nine five. 5,000, I think it is. Yeah. And if you ask for recruiting, you might get some money. But yeah, there, there is a recruiting program, and there, there are like internships. You make your dreams come true. Oh, yeah, you're a little boy still on the moon. <laughs> is, it, is it weird for me to hear my voice on different projects? I mean, or, or, or just different places of my body. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really strange, especially in other countries. If I'm on a plane and I hear my voice somewhere, that's, that's kind of weird. I was on a plane uh, a few weeks ago and heard something from the regular show. And it's that, that to me was really weird because I, I worked on that show on sort of a spotty basis. I'm not there all the time, but there are enough. And my characters are really weird. That show is really weird. And, and I don't always remember all the characters that I do because they'll throw them at me at the studio once I get there. And so to hear things like that, that I don't remember doing, that's really fun and really strange for me. But I finally got used to the sound of my own voice, so it doesn't bother me like it used to when I was pretty young in my career. I remember just hating the sound of my own voice very early on. And uh, I've gotten past that. We've made peace with each other. <laughs> Have you ever played against yourself in the same movie? Many, or many Mozart? times. <laughs> <laughs> I did a Chinese film years ago. Uh, it was called Her Name is Cat. It was a live action film. I played all of the men in the film. <laughs> <laughs> My buddy basically was trying to launch a toy line, and he needed the film dubbed really quickly.
quickly. And so there are two women and me, and we dubbed literally the entire film. And we were writing it on the fly. It was crazy. And so it, it was a lot of martial arts and stuff. So not only was I talking to myself, I was fighting myself and killing myself. And at the end of the day, I felt like, oh, man, I'm not sure who won. <laughs> yeah, it happens all the time. Well, in most of the animation, unlike the celebrities, we have to do more than one voice. Um, oh, that's right. Yes, yes. No, we, we by contract, they can have us do uh, three voices on a, on a basic contract and, and more on a bigger contract. And so, um, you know, no matter what we're hired for, they're, they're always going to throw something else at us. And quite often, we're working counter to our original character, sometimes without even taking a breath. Sometimes we don't even record them individually. We'll just record it all at once. It's pretty crazy. Okay, uh, so I wonder, for all three of you, what are your thoughts on the fact that they're actually working on a live action Bebop? And then secondly, your, you know, specifically your thoughts about the fact that it's actually going to be Keanu Reeves playing Spike. <laughs> you should probably, you should probably check, uh, check the news. I think that's four or five years old, right? Well, no, it's still being around. I mean, the, what is it, um, the, the director for the, the series just went ahead and actually said that he's greenlit the whole project. I mean, I mean, it's still in, in Watsonabe-san said that? I believe so. And that was recent? Last I checked, like, I think it was a few months back now. Oh, well, that's, that's great, yeah. We had a conversation about this just before we got here. Um, of course, when he was first announced as being attached as Spike, the whole anime community kind of went, <laughs> <laughs> you know, A, that they're going to make a live-action film, and B, that it's going to be Keanu Reeves. And uh, I didn't know what to think. I didn't want to pass judgment on it. I, I actually like some of his work, you know, I thought he was... But he's not a real bounty hunter. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know that. <laughs> they work in secret. Um, he's a ninja. Uh, I met him in an airport uh, a few years ago, and uh, I kind of stalked him. I had a little, it was almost a fanboy moment, but I was more out of curiosity, and I, I came up to him, and I introduced myself, and he actually knew who I was. Mm -hmm. He said that he had watched the series, and he had become a really big fan of the show. So he scored one point with me right there. <laughs> and then uh, he was really into it. And, and I didn't realize how tall he was. And he had the right body type. And, <laughs> and the voice was actually pretty cool. Hearing his normal speaking voice, it was pretty cool. I think he could pull that off. Uh, but what he did say was they wrote this fantastic script that would cost a half a billion dollars to make. <laughs> and if and when it ever got greenlit, he was afraid that he was going to be too old to do his own stunts. And that was important to him. So... You know, I hope that it still happens. And, and uh, Watanabe-san, as far as I know, was attached to the film. And if they gave him enough creative control, I think it could be a beautiful film. Uh, but that's if they gave him enough control, because it's his vision. And I think that he really needs to be the voice behind it. And to get Yoko Kano involved, I mean, we would have to have all those same elements, I think, to really play properly. Um, yeah, but I, I, he changed my mind, actually. Meeting him in person, he changed my mind. He's, he's a good dude. Guillermo del Toro kind of like, you know, 
doing some running some interference for us and kind of assuring them and, and uh, you know making the point that if you if you uh, want to tell the story about how good and wonderful these imaginary characters are and the happiness and joy if you want to take that seriously kids you know have a pretty good bullshit detector and they know that fear and darkness and those things are also real so don't shy away from that I think ultimately uh, being kind of straightforward about that gives you kind of a deeper experience, so that's the deal. Love the nightmare stuff, by the way. I was thinking, right? Chilling. Hey, Steve. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Steve's other son. <laughs> Hi, honey. <laughs> Check it out, man. I've watched your characters, and I know the real Steve Blue and the Steve Goose. <laughs> <laughs> this guy on the planet, man.
multiply that times a thousand because the voiceover community is a bunch of people who are really, really hardworking actors, but really good people. They're really kind, good people, very few big egos. We support each other, we actually work for each other for jobs. Even if we're up for the same role, I, I go up for the same roles with guys like Fred Tattashore all the time, John DiMaggio. Uh, sometimes I'll just say, you know, Fred's better at that than I am. Why don't you just hire him? And you don't get that too much in, in, in live action or any other business, for that matter. So that's what really kept me involved. And, and they're people that I choose to spend time with. I mean, Jerry and I have been friends for how many years now? I mean, a couple decades at least. You know, he's, he had a loop group called the Earwax, and we worked together back then. And, and, uh, and was it, Roger right, and we're still buddies. I mean, and, but this is the kind of people. It's it's quality people that are involved, and that's what really kept me involved. And I love what I do, and I would do it for no money. Don't tell my agent, but I did, and I still do from time to time. I still do it for very very low amounts of money. I still work on anime, which pays less than just about anything else in the industry with no residuals. But I do it to keep my job sharp and to work with those people again, because sometimes those communities don't cross. But for so many reasons, and, and the variety of things I get to do on a daily basis, too. Sure. Yeah, if you guys don't mind sticking around. privy to what's popular in other countries compared to what's popular here. I'm, I'm literally, I'm just a voice guy, so I don't really pay attention to what's going on in, in other countries necessarily. I rely on what other people tell me. Uh, I understand that bebop was very, very popular in Japan too, and many other countries as well. I had actually seen it dubbed in a couple of other languages, which is really odd. Uh, but yeah, I don't really pay attention. I barely pay attention to my own career. <laughs> This is Natalie, she's a voice actor, by the way. Her, uh, by the way, her show, Sword Art Online, her, her show aired on Toonami last night, which I host on Cartoon Network. So she is a professional voice actress. Welcome to the community, my darling. What were my top career-changing characters or moments? Well, ooh, when it be I'll, well, that's pretty easy actually. When I was hired as the voice of Tom for Toonami, uh, the guys brought me in based on Bebop, and that had never happened to me before. I always had to audition like crazy, and they said, "Well, no, we really we thought it was a cool character, and we liked the voice, and we would you consider taking this over and hosting a show on Cartoon Network?" And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was when it sort of dawned on me that I could actually make a career out of this. And I, I had another career. I was working two other jobs at the time. So I didn't count on it and still didn't count on it until about, about eight, nine years ago when I was still working for Full Moon. Uh, but there have been so many benchmark things. But, but Cowboy Bebop was certainly a benchmark in my career to the point where I tattooed Spike's voice on my arm. Oh. Uh, nice. At 40 years old, that was, <laughs> that, was, that was a really strange thing for me to do. But it, it was that much of a benchmark in my career, um, and and getting to play characters like Wolverine or Green Goblin, these iconic characters that I grew up loving, uh, that was crazy for me. The other one that I would say was really. Uh, sort of a turning point for me where I, I thought, oh man, this is like living on my kid fantasy, was playing Yaki Doodle for Harvey Birdman. <laughs> but I got to play Yaki Doodle and that was a character that I loved as a little kid. So. I wish I had his bank book. <laughs> no, too much pressure. Are there any other characters from your childhood that you get to play that you would love to do? Man, I've been so lucky. I, I've said this before that um, I wasn't expecting to get any of the characters that I've been able to play. So I'm just grateful every single day. It's kind of my mantra of gratitude every day that that I still get to do this, let alone do great characters. Um, the 
only one. Yeah, I've said Batman Speak before. Of Batman. Yeah, I have said Batman before. I got to play Lego Batman. <laughs> In the original Lego Batman, I was Batman who was nonverbal. He just went, ugh, ugh. <laughs> but just to put on the cowl, even in a toy form, was awesome for me. Um, and I and I was able to record Batman for a thing for the troops um, a while back that never saw the light of day. The military decided they didn't want to use it. Uh, yeah, it made me kind of sad. But the guys who have played Batman are so great, and they're all my friends. And Kevin Conroy is, is just unbelievable. And now Troy Baker and Yay. and uh, who else is playing Batman? So many. Roger Craig Smith, yeah, is playing the most recent Batman. Um, these guys are all my friends, and so, you know, if, if they get the gig, great. And, and no matter what I bring to it, they're going to bring something different. So if I do get to play Batman someday, great. If not, I've had a really good run, and I'll continue to be grateful and grateful that they get the job, too. Wow, a lot of hands. What does your tattoo say? Pardon me? What does your tattoo say? My tattoo says bang. Whoa. It's actually, yeah, I, I lifted that from the very last scene of uh, the Bebop series. For those of you who haven't seen it, I won't spoil what happens, but <laughs> basically it's the last word he says in the series, and uh, I lifted that, put it into Pro Tools, and so that's an exact audio file Whoa. of my voice. Yeah. It kind of looks like a swordfish, too. Yeah. People think it's an earthquake. I think it's a phallic symbol and a tornado. <laughs> uh, very quickly. Uh, video game work is just more labor intensive. Basically, instead of a script that's you know thirty pages or a hundred pages in the case of a film, it's about five thousand pages. And sometimes I'll do. Uh, six, eight hundred lines in a four-hour session, three to ten takes of each line. And in video games, it's just more vocally stressful all the way around, especially when there are games with fighting scenes and things. And they'll, they'll say, okay, now you're dying by electrocution, now you're dying by strangling, now you're dying with a bullet, now you're dying with a sword. Dead Island. Dead Island, I, there was a lot of dying in that, you know. Yeah, and, Dead Island was a weird one, too, because I went in thinking that I was going to be doing a Caribbean accent. I walked in the room, they said, well, we decided we'll, we're going to do Australian, go. <laughs> but we don't want it to be full Australian, we want it to be like, you know, just an approximation of it, which was good for me because I do a crappy Australian accent, so it worked out for it. But, but yeah, that's the other challenge, is everything is just very fast, they're on very tight time schedules, and in shows like Mass Effect and some of these other big games, They've got hundreds of actors that they have to get through and scripts that are literally that thick. So it's just, it's stressful all the way around. Door stoppers, yes, for big doors, castle <laughs> doors. <laughs> and then we'll get to you next. I'm It's a lot of pressure. Um, it's it's great, you know. It's, it's really wonderful, and, and like I was saying about the stories before, the the fan stories are really what keep me interested. And it gets overwhelming sometimes, especially conventions and you know things like Comic Con and places where I just get mobbed. It's weird, and I'm a, like a celebrity for two or three days, and then I go home and nobody knows me anymore. So I I, I get the best of both worlds there, but. Uh, you know, I, I saw it from the very beginning where they really didn't want American voice actors messing with uh, anime at all. And when I was working on The Guyver and some of those shows, I actually did my first convention um, in San Jose, and I had my life threatened by the otaku there because they uh, <laughs> dubs were not acceptable. It was it was subs only and. Oh. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, and thank you for not threatening my life. <laughs> uh, you had a question there. I have two questions that are kind of odd. One is, if you became a character on Simpsons, who would play your voice? <laughs> uh, if you became, you know, cast as a 
you know, celebrity is a sensitive character. <laughs> Who would you do your voice? Would you do your own voice? And uh, secondly, this is way way off the beaten path. Is I'm i I'm, I'm into art and all this, the designing and everything. I keep looking at his pants being so short. Why are his pants so short when he's walking in the scene? You see his shoes and this much space between his pants. And I'm going, no, that's not stylish. You can't be wearing those pants. So you're talking about Spike, right? Yeah. You should see how small his underwear are. <laughs> why, why did they design his, his pants? To be so well, I'm, I'm married to a costume so designer. I can tell you why. Okay. Makes him look taller. Okay. It's very simple. Ooh. They want somebody taller? No, well, it makes him look taller if his pants are short. You see more of the boot. It's a trick that costume designers do. These guys are just too kid too hip. <laughs> you don't get anything caught when you're kicking but tell, too. But the other question's a lot better. What was that? Oh, if, if I already have another actor play me in The Simpsons? Well, first of all, I want that gig. <laughs> you know, I, I read for The Simpsons years and years ago. I went out to the studio a lot and I read for the, the casting director. And she said, you know what, that was a really good audition. But unless you're a celebrity, you'll never work on the show, honey. But she let me read for her. That was a really cool thing. So, first of all, I'd like to do it. Secondly, why not Keanu Reeves? <laughs> why not? I've come up with? It. Oh man. <laughs> you like a Jim Carrey kind of? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, somewhere in the lower intestine. <laughs> no, literally. Uh, literally. Uh, I was <laughs> I was voicing uh, uh, what was it Wolverine in one of the games, and I was doing a fight scene, and I had to do yeah! this, this swipe thing, and I farted while I swiped. <laughs> But they said that was the real. That was such a cool effect that you did with your throat. Can you do that again? We'd like to get another take. And they said, I don't think that. Oh, maybe you could be on Family Guy. Maybe. Maybe. That's one of their main sound effects. Yeah, I do stunt belch and stunt fart. So, yeah. but usually with my hands. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Oh, there's a few more back there. There's a waving hand back there. Yes, you. Finally, I have a question for Peter and me both. Uh, Peter, since you were a storyboard artist since the beginning, and you know, since when did you want to become a filmmaker to direct movies? Or would you direct a live action in the future? And my question is like, when I do animations on YouTube, like if you know this game Minecraft, they're a little out. So I try to like, I never storyboard because I'm doing my own thing, so it's my in my head, so I just go animate. So when you are making your own movie, and I'm sure you had to do the story for so right, uh, right, Guardians, but I mean, did, did that make a difference, like for always storyboarding and did, did, did it cut? Uh, you, yeah, well, generally when you're doing animation, storyboarding is like the first step in the right, process yeah. to, you know, you, you kind of have to do it. And I had a, a great team of story artists I worked with, so I did some, but the, the bulk of it was done by, by our story team, so it was... Uh, it was it was great, you know. I got to kind of continue what I what I had always done, but other people had to do it, so that was. Excuse me. Did you always want it to be like a director? Or yeah, actually, the funny thing is, I wanted to be. Uh, I I got into storyboarding as a way to get into the business, so I could be a director someday, oh, okay. and that I could, you know, because I was making my little Super Eight films and. Yeah. You know, goofing around. I, I didn't really know, you know, the craft of filmmaking, and that's what working in the business kind of did for me. It was just like a long, ex extended film school that uh, I got paid to go to, basically. Right. And while I was doing live action storyboards, I got to direct some second units, so I got some experience behind the camera there in live action. And uh, yeah, I, the animation was, it, in a strange way, it's kind of a, I don't know, but I, I can't call it a detour because it's kind of been my home now for like past eight years, but right. it, I wasn't intending to go into animation, I just kind of I kind of fell into it and I've learned so much uh, while I've been there that hopefully I can apply to a live action film someday. Yeah, I heard, I watched this interview, like a really old AFI interview, I think, and then Spielberg was saying that every director should be an animator before he becomes a director. 
I think it's a good but Would you do a live action movie ever really? Oh heck yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I want to. I mean I wanna I wanna go back to my to, to my roots. You know, that's where <laughs> that's what I started out wanting to do and uh, the little that I've done it just gives you you know, it just gives you a taste for doing more. Right, and it's cheaper too because I can't do live action all the time so I make animation. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's it's, 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 and I, for C, the question was like, you know, I watched, since I was working, I think your voice is in my head, and I kind of know now, which, if I, even if I watch anything, I know I really can see, you can tell. And I don't know, you know, Tsunami, Cowboy, Bebop, and lots of characters that you have done, they're so intense, and just before, uh, you said that you just have to go in there, and they give you pages, and you have to be intense, and do it right away, and you have to have it in your thing. But, you know, when, when you watch these, like, incredible stories, I think script writers who have put in so much work into make these stories, each shot is like story work. Everybody puts so much time and effort into it to understand every shot, story-wise. And acting is also, like, one of the parts, right? So, how do you go so fast and just, like, do it? You know, don't you get some time to, like, create this character on your own and try to understand it? Because it's so intense. Like, I didn't understand when I was 14 when I watched Cup by Depot. I watched five years ago again, and I was like, wow. I should make a live action movie out of this. <laughs> and then the news comes out, you know, and I was like, okay, I'll probably do it 50 years later. <laughs> but yeah, you know, tell us something about that. How do you do it? Like, you go there and make up the character so fast, and it's just crazy. I, I can't believe it. Yeah, well, it's always been sort of playtime for me. Walking into a studio has been my playground. That's my sandbox. And it's, it's really nothing different than being a little kid on a playground and, you know, holding up your little toys and putting voices to them and having them fight each other. To me, that, that's the same process that goes through my head. I just have a little bit of training so that I know how to make it sound a little more realistic, hopefully. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the writing, too. If the writing is good, it makes our job so easy. And if the character design is really good and the vision of the director is really good, um, without a great director, we'd be nothing. It'd be nothing up there. I, I really rely heavily on my director for context and, and knowing the whole scope of the vision and, and guiding me gently through that process and still letting me be creative in that process. So it, it's really a, an, an incredible collaborative effort. And and I don't think that I would be good at it without that collaboration. I really like being a team player. And so I, I, I think that's what's kept me alive in the business as long as I've been, just because I take direction well and I play well with others. And I'm not afraid to use my imagination no matter how stupid I look. And when you're doing, when you're doing voice work, you don't look pretty. You just don't look pretty. Um, which is, I think, one of the reasons that some celebrities didn't want to do it for many years because, because they would go in there and, you know, you have to do some sort of really horrible sound and, you know, you have to contort your, your whole body and it might mess up your makeup a little bit. So I, I've never cared about any of that stuff. I just go in really not caring about anything but the quality of the project and getting as deep into that character's head as I possibly can. And that sense of joy and fun has to be present for me. So it's completely organic. There really doesn't have to be any preparation for me unless there's something very specific that they're looking for. In the case of something like Wolverine or Transformers, I might get the script a night or two before just so I have some sense of the story arc. Um, but without that, I'd still do pretty well just because that is my training to do it on the fly.